Well, it's good to see you, and I see some visitors here today. Uh, welcome to Hillside Community Church. We're just glad to have you with us in our fall kickoff today. So um, let's just bow in a word of prayer before we get into the Word of God this morning. Jesus, we just want to thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, God, that you see each person that's here today. You see all of the needs that are here, God, and, and all of the things that are going through everyone's lives, Lord. Um, and God, your word speaks into our lives in a very practical way. So Lord, as we go through uh, j the first part of John chapter 9 this morning, God, we pray that you would be glorified in this, God, and that our eyes would be turned to you. And uh, we know, God, that you, you have a special thing um, in mind for each person here today. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So today we're continuing our series, for those of you who are new here or visiting, uh, we're continuing our series in the book of John, and we come to John chapter 9 this morning, and uh, we just finished uh, talking about how Jesus was in um, teaching at, at the temple after the Feast of Tabernacles and how he um, came to the end of his teaching there, and uh, he claimed in the end, that he was in fact God. So that created a stir. Um, some people are going, oh, well, he, he is the Messiah. Maybe he's the Messiah. And they were, uh, were uh, really um, interested in that statement. And then there were other religious leaders who thought to themselves, this is blasphemy. How can he claim to be God if he's just a man? Well, um, Jesus told them that before their father Abraham was, he says, I am. And uh, so the Pharisees, they uh, looked at that and they wanted to kill him. But the, the scriptures tell us in John 8 that Jesus made his escape. It wasn't, God, it wasn't God's time to go to the cross. So it was an escape that he made. And uh, this is where we pick up on today's message. So... Um, so normally when, when someone faces extreme persecution, uh, they go into hiding. Um, but Jesus, uh, he showed the people that he, he wasn't at all rattled by what had just happened with the Pharisees trying to kill him. And immediately, he continues his ministry work. So here we are in John chapter 9, starting with verse 1. So we're going to read from verses 1 to 3 to start here. So... If you got your Bibles, turn with me, and if you don't, you can follow along on the overhead here. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Hmm. Interesting. Now, there was a common perception in the Jewish culture of that day that when a person was, was ill with, with, a, with a grievous illness, that it was because someone along the line was sinning. It was either the parents that were sinning or it was the, was the, God, the person himself that was sinning. And before I go further into this message today, I believe God desires that I address the issue of sickness. So when I'm referring to sickness, I'm referring to the physical sickness here, the breakdown of health of a human body becoming susceptible to some sort of disease. I mean, we've all been sick at one time or another, and, and we'll probably all face sickness in the coming days. Um, We've all had a cold or a flu, and so we all understand at least a little bit of what it is to be sick. And, and other of us, uh, others of us here uh, are presently suffering from some kind of illness, some sort of disease, um, diabetes, epilepsy, cancer, heart disease, or other kind of disease. And um, there is this thought out there, and actually there's a, a teaching that you can if, you, if you're looking at internet preachers and stuff, there's a teaching out there that says that um, 
someone who is sick, it's because it is a result of personal unresolved sin that they're facing sickness or a lack of faith issue because it's never God's desire that anyone face illness. And, um, you know, we're, I mean, the fact of the matter is that every family faces illness. All of us face illness. So, so this teaching is not helpful. It actually causes a lot of disillusionment with what the Bible actually teaches about illness. We see in this particular case in John chapter 9, there was a man who was born blind. So, and uh, Jesus was asked, is it because this guy's parents were sinners, they sinned and, you know, did some grievous sin, or did, be, was it because of him, you know, there's something in him that was innately sinful? This is an honest question that they had, and Jesus is like, no, that's not the case at all. There's other reasons, but in certain contexts, talking about sickness, it's true that some sicknesses can be attributed to God's discipline or His judgment on sin. This is true. For example, King David, King David recognized, he recognized that his physical health had been adversely affected because of his choices to disobey God. David appealed to God in Psalm chapter 38. We see this in, from verses 1 to, to 5. David understood that what he was facing was because of choices that he had made to rebel against God's standards. He said, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. So we see David understanding that some of the choices that he made resulted in him becoming physically ill. Or consider what God says in Leviticus to the nation of Israel. This is part of instructions in the law of Moses. He promises them that he's going to bless them physically with abundance and health if they live in obedience to him. But in Leviticus 26, 14 to 17, we read, But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases, and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and those will flee even when no one, and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. So there is a case here where blatant disregard for God and disobedience to Him can result in God using sickness as judgment or, or disciplinary judgment on, on His people. Or consider Jesus. He said to the crippled man that he healed. Jesus had healed a crippled man in John chapter 5. We've already went through this. John 5, 13 to 15. In this case, a man who had been crippled for 38 years, he made, was made completely well by Jesus. And the man was overjoyed, you know, leaping around. He had been crippled for 38 years. All of a sudden, he's walking again. Well, when the Pharisees asked him who healed him, we read in John 5, 13 to 15, the man didn't know. For Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So the crippled man was practicing something. There was something in his life that was a vice. And Jesus cared enough about his future to actually tell him and warn him to repent from what he was doing or something worse might happen. Now, we might be referring to an illness coming on him, or maybe it's something to do with eternal judgment. Maybe both. But for sure, his personal sin was connected by Jesus 
to illness if he didn't repent. The Apostle Paul speaks of a connection between physical sickness and, and, and death even in, uh, and personal sin in a Christian context to the church. When he explains to the church in Corinth that they ought to examine themselves before taking communion and deal with issues of sin. So we actually studied this passage in our midweek Bible study. We, we discussed it a little bit. And uh, I thought, yeah, this, this kind of fits in with what we're uh, talking about here today in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. So anyone who eats this bread, talking about the communion bread and the communion cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating and drinking, eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Notice, this is to Christians, right? That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, I could go on. There's other examples, but I'm not going to. The, the picture here, it's clear that there are times when our human illnesses are brought on by personal sin. It is true. But that being said, I think it's always wise for us when we're ill, to ask the Lord to practice self-examination when we're sick. Is there something, God, that I have been doing that's been attributing to this? If so, we repent to that, we turn, and we do what's right. Now, but this is not always the case, is it? There's a lot of illness out there. And in my study of Scripture, I'm convinced that most sickness, in fact, does not arise from personal sin issues. I believe the Scripture cautions us very, very much against making glib connections between the two. We must make no assumptions. Judgmental assumptions can hurt people very deeply. And you can be totally off in left field and wrong. The truth is that all sickness and death is the result of sin's effect in this world. What I mean by that is that the existence of pain and suffering and sorrow and ailments and death is because of the effect of sin in the universe. When sin entered the world in Genesis 3, the world became cursed and corrupted because of it. Therefore, any time any of us has sickness of any kind, it is because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen and corrupted world. However, in the case that Jesus presents here to us in our text today, the people assumed that this poor blind man was blind because of some kind of personal sin issue that either he or his parents had, right? Right? But Jesus clears the air. He says in verse 3 of our text saying, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. Said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus continues in verse 4 saying, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So here we see right off this illness that this man was suffering, this blindness that he had from birth, was not a result of personal sin. There are times when a person is sick because God wants to use that illness to bring some glory to himself through it. This is a prime example of that. In other places in Scripture, you remember the story of Job? If you haven't read the story of Job, it's a, it's a good read. And it's, it's, it's actually like, whoa, 
This guy really went through it, man. He went through it. He was not only sick, but he, calamity uh, struck him. And um, the reason why, and we see, and I'm just going to make the short story, or the story short. It's a very lengthy story, and a lot of things we can explore and learn through Job. But the fact is that God wanted to prove Job's faith as genuine. So he permitted Job to be afflicted and to suffer, and to suffer greatly. And, and what do we see in Job? We see Job's friends. Yeah, thank you for praying. We'll continue to pray for him. And um, I guess this fits right in line with where we're going with my message today. The, re the reality is, folks, that um, life is filled with trials. And this physical body that we live in was never meant to be our permanent place. So we're, we're facing, each one of us here today, we're facing the fact that today could be the last breath that we take in this body. But as Christians, we have a hope. You see, I'm going to continue my message this morning. Some illnesses are a result of personal sin, but most aren't. It's because we live in a fallen state, a fallen world. And, you know, we know with, with Job, he had miserable comforters. They couldn't get this through their head. They thought, he must have done something. It wasn't the case. Someone, sometimes sickness comes to us because we're growing old and things in our system start to shut down. Many here identify with the Apostle John when Jesus describes the very kind of death he would have. He, he said, very truly I tell you in John 21, 18, when you were younger, you addressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And it's the apostle, as the apostle Peter puts it this way, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 24 and 25. For, and I want you all to listen to this, this happened here today not outside of the spectrum of God. God had this happen here to get everyone's attention. All people, this is in my notes, This is where this message is going. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, each one of us here, unless we face a traumatic event, like a car collision or, you know, maybe someone kills us. All of us are going to find that our body is going to fade due to some kind of illness. We fade through sickness shutting us down and our bodily system shut down. But the Lord understands and he loves us dearly. You see, life isn't just here and now. If you're coming here today, though in the world, life is just about here and now. And if you don't see the things you want here and now, well, you just feel ripped off and it's just wrong, right? But God has an eternal glory for his saints in mind. As a matter of fact, when the time comes for us to pass from this world to the next, God says this in Psalm 116, verse 15, and I want you to hear this. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Why is it precious? Because despite what you hear out there, your life is a fleeting moment. You're like the grass of the field that grows and then withers. 
You see, God has eternity in mind for everything that we're going through here. And what Jesus promises in the Word is that if we come to take Him as our Savior and our Lord, okay, when we pass from this physical realm, which all of us eventually will, there is eternal life awaiting us. So don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord has a plan, and His plan is eternal. See, in, Paul, in Paul's testimony, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18, he says, he says this, and I want you to hear it this morning. Therefore, because of everything the way it is, and the broken state of our world and the fallen state of it is, therefore we, but, but because of Jesus, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Just, he's continuing to improve, stabilized, and he's with the paramedics now. Though outwardly, though, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So no matter what we go through here. For you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, there is an eternal glory that far outweighs absolutely everything we can go through here in the world. And Paul went through an awful lot. But he recognized that for him to live was Christ. It's fruitful time for him to be able to share Christ with the people that God put in his, in, his, in his life. But for him to die is actually gain. Because in the end, all of us are going there. 100% of the people in this room are going to face death. Unless, of course, the rapture comes. 100% of people in the generation prior have faced death. This is the for sure thing. This planet... And everything that's going on in it is temporary. So we fix our eyes, it says, Paul says. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but it, what is unseen is eternal. Folks, do you, do you see what the Holy Spirit's doing here? This is reality. There's people here that are living their lives out of sync with God. You don't know tomorrow if you've got another day. You know, for many instances, we're aware that... Um, Physical decline is taking place. And it's our natural human response to failing health and sickness to get anxious and de depressed. It's a melancholy spectacle to see someone in physical distress like, like our brother here. It really is. And it's difficult. I can see it in everybody's faces. It's difficult to see, isn't it? It's difficult. Paul, however, had come to a point in his life where he recognized the natural state of how things go. And he understood that the progressive decay of himself outwardly was thankfully being accompanied by a proportional renewal of himself inwardly. And this is why Paul was able to express encouragement to the believers. Those who were facing hardships, different kinds of troubles, 
And he encourages them to turn their eyes and fix their gaze upon the one who is the author of life, who gives eternal life when this life is over. And this is why in the midst of our adversity, God encourages us with this. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, he says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that promise, folks? This is for people like you, people like me, people like our brother and sister here who are facing all kinds of different things. God is not unaware of our brokenness and our weakness in this physical realm. You see, He has a peace, and He promises that He will walk through the valleys of the shadow of death with us. And death has a terrible shadow it casts, doesn't it? And when we look at the shadow of death, it can cause anxiety. But, but if we understand what the Word of God says is that the Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know that you are with me. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. This is the promise in God's Word. So we can take this and we can place our trust in Jesus. The Bible says that one who places their trust in Jesus is like one who puts their house and builds it upon the rock. And when the winds blow and the gales blow against that house, it stays firm because it is rooted on the rock. And in this world, we have trouble. But in Hebrews 13, 14, the writer of the Hebrews to the Hebrews says this, for this world is not our home. Did you hear it? This world is not our home. We are looking forward to an everlasting home in heaven. But involving the text that we have today, the healing that was about to occur at the hand of Jesus was pre-planned by God to glorify Jesus and to bring a testimony of His person to the people to show the people that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth and He holds the keys to our lives in His hands. Despite the Pharisees and other religious leaders saying that He was a blasphemer, Jesus was in fact telling the world the truth by what He did in this circumstance by bringing this blind man back his sight. He was, in fact, supporting his statement of truth that I am, I am. And that is what God called himself when Moses was sent to Egypt to set the Israelites free from slavery. Who should I say has sent me, said Moses. I am has sent you. That is who you are to say has sent you. I am, because God is always was, always will be. Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. And when you put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters and calmed the sea, you put your hand in the man from, the hand of the man from Galilee, you're not putting your hand just in the hand of a man. You're putting your hand in the Messiah, the Son of God, who is Lord of heaven and earth, who created things and set things into motion. He is no ordinary man, but he has the world in his hands. 
And he understands the beginning from the end and the stories that happen in between. So here the Lord is, and he spits in the mud. After saying this, he spit in the ground and made some mud with saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. You see, the story here is not so much about the physical healing of this man as it is a statement to show us who God is in eternity. See, God has the, has the keys to life and death. And yes, this world was subjected to frustration because of the fall. And God, I want you to know this, that despite the brokenness and sickness and illness and the things that we see crumbling in our own physical being and were around us, we see this happening around us. But I want you to know that God is working a plan for redemption of what is broken. He, redemption means to take and restore to its rightful place. You see, your life and my life amounts to a little pin dot on a line that stretches forever. And that's why Paul is able to say our light and momentary suffering, it doesn't seem like it when we're going through it, but really, it is very fleeting and we don't have very long to live. This week's been tough for me. I have a 91-year-old mother-in-law at home who's really struggling physically. I was up in Prince George on Tuesday having an examination done on my heart because there's a problem with my heart. These are all reminders to us that this is not our home. You see, that, that blind man who was born blind, he, he, he was living in a condition where he thought, is this ever, this night ever going to end? And it's, the fact of the matter is that this, this time was going to actually end. He didn't realize it. Can you imagine? All your life you're born without being able to see. You, you'd hear voices, but you'd never be able to even know what a person actually looks like. And all of a sudden, the blinders come off, and you can see. Can you imagine how that man must have felt to see the voices that were speaking to him throughout his life or people that he knew or just to even see the trees and the flowers and the, and the, the scene around him? Just imagine how that must have impacted him. All of a sudden, he was brought back into this reality of sight. It must have been like, you know, David, when he wrote... In Psalm 139, 7 to 13, he said, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, Surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will be not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For, my, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. There is periods of darkness, folks, that we encounter because of the physical reality of the world in which we live. But I want you to know that it's not darkness to God. He, in, in fact, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He knit us together in our mother's womb. So this blinded man went out in healing as a spectacle to all who knew him. And Apostle John writes in verse 8, he says, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him, seen him begging, asked, isn't this the same man who used to be, sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. But he insisted, I am the man. 
How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. Folks, this man didn't even know what hit him. But he knew that Jesus was someone special. And later, we're going to talk about this next week, Jesus revealed to him the true identity of who he was, and this man fell and worshipped. Now, you and I have a mission in this world, and God has a special place for you to fit into the grand scheme of his plan. Whether you realize it or not, God has a plan for you. And you're not going to leave this world until your mission is complete. There's not a day that you can add. There's not a day that you can subtract. God has a mission for you. So while you have the breath in this body, it means fruitful ministry for you to minister to the needs of the people around you that God's placed in your life. And God can use brokenness. He shows it all the time. God uses broken circumstances and broken people. Dan posted a video this week of Nick Wojcik. Does anyone who know, know who Nick Wojcik is? Yeah, this guy here posted a video about Nick Wojcik ministering to people that were broken and how God has, has used him despite the fact that he was born with no arms and no legs and had every reason in the world to look at life as a giant bummer. It's not like he always had this joy of the Lord and his strength. He had to go through the fire. There was times he didn't want to live. But God took that man and used that man, and now he speaks to millions of people all over the world. People listen because they know this is a man that has seen the worst things that the physical realm can throw at him. And yet, what has he got? He has a joy. He has a purpose for living. And he inspires people. The Lord blessed him with a family even. And, 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 and his joy is just infectious. Or Joni Erickson, for instance. You guys know the story of Joni Erickson in 1967? She was diving into, uh, into the water, and she misjudged the shallowness of the water. She banged her head, and she became a quadriplegic. And the story of Joni is incredible. She learned how to paint with her, with her teeth, with a brush in her teeth. Became an accomplished artist that way. I have five or six books down in my office, if you ever want to read them, about her life story, of how she's ministering to people and encouraging other people that Jesus Christ is the answer to the world today. And if you, if you turn your, your trust to Jesus, He will take you through life's difficulties and He'll bring you into everlasting life. You see, God's unique in the way that he works in lives. This blind man, yes, he had to endure blindness for many years, but then Jesus turned the lights on. And you see, that man right now is in heaven, enjoying his sight, enjoying all the presence of God for all of eternity. His trouble, as difficult as it would have been, for his parents to see their child born blind and to have this whole terrible thing take place as difficult as it would have been for them to see. This man was redeemed. And this story is a story of redemption and how God has a story of redemption in store for every person who believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the sacrifice of God who died so that we wouldn't have to die, who took the judgment of God upon himself so that we wouldn't have to. 
The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the whole point of it. Though outwardly we are wasting away, friends, inwardly we can be being renewed day by day, though we face the torment of life's brokenness. God is with us. The Lord says He will never leave us or forsake us. He will be with us to the very end of the age. We don't understand why we have to suffer and why there's pain and brokenness in this world. We don't necessarily understand the overarching plan of God because His wisdom in doing this is beyond us. If it is better to have a fallen world now so that a glorious, redeemed world might be revealed in the future for eternity, I think I have to come to the point where I bow on my knee to the Lord and I say, Lord, I don't understand this, but I know that you do, so I, I will place my hand in your hand, O Lord, because I trust you. God is trustworthy, folks. Nothing escapes his gaze. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. God did his work through physically healing this man. Sometimes God does his work by taking us home. As a matter of fact, every one of us is going to get taken home. Every one of us is going to succumb to some form of ailment. That's what dying is. Your body is shutting down. So while we have the strength in us, let's give glory to God. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today is a day of salvation. You can come to know Him and the power of who He is and His resurrection. You can come to know resurrection power and it doesn't say that when you become a Christian, all of a sudden, everything's going to get easy. As a matter of fact, sometimes it gets even harder. But the Lord said, never will He leave us because He walks with us through life's trials. When you're out there and you don't know the Lord, you walk through life's trials on your own. And what a scary, dark place that is. But when you come to the Lord... You walk with the hand of the man from Galilee in your hand and he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. You need not fear any evil for he is with you. Our light and momentary troubles, friends, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you that you hear our cries. Thank you, God, for answering our prayer this morning for John to come back. And we just pray right now, Lord, that as he's down in the hospital, that you would comfort him, Lord, and you'd strengthen his physical body. Lord, we do pray for the healing of his body, Lord, but you know what it is that you have planned for him, Lord, and, and your plans are good, and your eternal plan is in place. God, we just pray for his wife right now, too. She's she's really afraid of what's happening here, Lord. And, and we just pray that you would just give her an extra blanket of peace right now in Jesus' name, that you'd comfort her, that you'd shelter her, that, Father, that a blanket of peace would fall upon both of them in Jesus' name right now. And we thank you, Lord, that you care about us. We thank you that you listen to our cries. You hear our cries. You see the state of our brokenness, Lord. And yet you love us, God, and you extend yourself to us. And you take us by the hand and you lead us through the valleys, O oh God. And you're leading us to an eternal glory that far outweighs everything that we experience here. And for that, we're thankful. God, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, I just pray that you'd speak to their hearts today, if that's you, if you're hearing online, if you're sitting here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, today you can do it. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that He is the Savior and you ask Him to forgive your sins, He will come and He will make His home in you. He'll make all things new. 
That's a promise. If you cast yourself upon him, he cares for you and he'll pick you up. And he'll give you hope and a reason to live in the future. If that's you today, I'd be very, I want to pray with you today after the service. Please come and find me or maybe someone else that you know that knows Jesus and walks with them, with him. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you in abundance this afternoon as we go down and we fellowship and have a barbecue. I pray that you would have a wonderful afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.